these are the stories of how history's most important music scenes influence our culture and change the way we live. Under the influence. Back in 1655, the sun never set on the British Empire. That year, the British Navy kicked the Spanish out of Jamaica and claimed a large Caribbean island in the name of the mother country. England's colonies from Asia to Africa and throughout the Western Hemisphere helped make it one of the wealthiest, most influential empires the world has ever seen. The 19th century saw England's industrial revolution blossom. The rich got richer, and the way the working class works changed forever. For it is the empire, which includes one quarter of all the land and of all the peoples of the world, that gives to Britain its position as a first-class power. Then came the wars. By the time World War II ended, England was badly bruised, looking to its far-flung colonial population to help rebuild. By the time of the 1970s, the influx of immigrants with brown skin led to unprecedented racial tension with economic downturn and energy crisis putting the country in a state of emergency. The government had put a cap on wages while inflation spiked out of control. Workers went on strike. Power outages were the routine. Battle lines were being drawn along race and class like never before. Post-Empire Great Britain was locked in a struggle to define itself. I mean, it was kicking off here, man. You know, we had riots in the late 70s, talking massive unemployment, three-day weeks, rise of the National Front. The popular music of the time was like a million miles removed from the feeling on the street. The cultural climate was pretty dread. Me and the brothers, we had a soundtrack to ease our pain. We had reggae but my white mates weren't so lucky. So my white mates set about creating a soundtrack that was relevant to their situation, sort of of the people, for the people, by the people. London was the center of the punk rock universe. The Roxy turned out to be the very first live punk rock venue in the UK. It was so early in the whole punk rock scene that there weren't any UK punk records to play. So what am I going to do? I'm going to play something I like. So I'm playing hardcore dub reggae. And this all really came out of the fact that all these white kids grew up with black people living next door. We weren't alien, we weren't exotic. We were their mates. So there was some serious cultural exchange going on. Man, when two-tone broke, it hit big time. It had that magic combination of danceable music with style and attitude. But the art is being able to slip ideas in underneath all of that. I mean, you know, they're singing about unemployment. They're singing about racism. They're singing about teenage pregnancy. The bands are actually multiracial, and they signposted the way that UK culture was heading that it was the people that got behind multiculturalism that would make England great again. And out of that came this whole two-tone movement, the specials. They were the most politicized of all the bands. Ghost Town perfectly captured the atmosphere of the time and the mood of the country. I mean, that's why it went to number one. This town was coming and it goes down. If England was a 45 RPM record, Coventry would be the hole in the middle. It was an industrial city. Coventry was the Detroit of England. A lot of car factories, a lot of industry, a large immigrant population. Um, my roots are in Jamaica. My parents come from Jamaica. My father moved to Coventry because of work to rebuild England after the, the, the last World War, you know? Just before I left Jamaica, the big song was like sort of, um, ska, ska, ska. <laughs> And this dance like that, da, Jamaica, ska. Pick it up, pick it, you know, it's old, and as a little kid, you know? I got the music bug, you know? And it was true ska. Obviously, two-tone, black and white. It's a melting pot. You got the reggae ska side, you got the punk side, which is a bit more aggressive, and you pull all those people together. It, it, it was a perfect marriage. In 
England, it was essentially a working class movement. In the Midlands, where most of Two Tones started, there was an interesting industrial integration. If you're working on a factory track next to somebody, it don't really matter what colour he is. After five or six years, you get the idea that you've got way more in common than your differences. All over the empire, but particularly in the Caribbean, people were invited, come over for three years, help rebuild the mother country or make a fortune. People ended up having kids in England before they ever had enough money to buy the castle in Jamaica, and, and they were English kids. Yeah, is it your favourite music? Yeah. yeah. But of course. You know, Jim English, like Rankin Roger. So we were living in times where there was high unemployment, there was a lot of racism, and out came all these different bands who were trying to merge different types of music together, and the beat happened to be one of them. Around that time, I was 16, 17, and I was a punk rocker, and I got a lot of abuse from black people just for being a punk being what I wanted to be. And the punks loved me, so I knew there wasn't racism within the punks, and even a lot of the skinheads were all right once you got to talk to them. There were anti-Nazi skins, and there was Nazi skins, and, and it was very hard to tell the difference unless they shook your hand or nutted you. <laughs> you could soon tell. And they said, oh, I like that. Got black geezers and white geezers on stage together. I like that. I'll have a bit of that. And we immediately went, well, that's why we did it. Of course, we thought you'd like it. Thanks, mate. <laughs> One of the first tunes was Mirror in the Bathroom. In the bathroom. I heard this punk rhythm going on, and I heard this drummer playing reggae, but he says to me later on, he thought he was playing punk. All he knew was to hit him hard. This is Everett Morton. New wave mixed with reggae, mixed with soul. There was calypso, there was punk, there was pop. There was everything mixed into it. And we don't know what time it comes from. We all just kind of meld it together. There were not that many mixed race women that you would find either in the media, on television, on radio. People were very surprised, I think, to find black people and white people being in the same band and making music together. And that was the whole point. At the end of Britain's industrial age, Orgreave was a confrontation from the Middle Ages. Margaret Thatcher had just come to power, so we had a Conservative government in power. There was a lot of youth unemployment around. There were also laws on the streets called anti-sus laws, which meant that if you were black and you were young, you could be picked up and interrogated for no real reason at all other than you just happened to be hanging around. The specials and gangsters went top ten, and then they brought, I think it was Madness out next, and that went top ten. Then the selector, that went top ten. And that's when we came along and opened up for the selector. We were the fourth release on Two Tone. That went top ten. Within nine months of the band forming, we were already on top of the pops. By the time we got to New York, it was as though we'd set up this mobile sociology class that just had music in the back to listen to while you discussed race relations. In order to be anything in the late 70s, early 80s, you had to actually be saying something. We came out with a, a song called Stand Down Margaret, which all the women at Green and Common at the time, I mean, I, I remember hearing them on the news singing Stand Down Margaret, which was our song, and the miners who were on strike. That was ground roots working class music. I thought we'd bring out Stand Down Margaret and it would cause such an uproar. She'd go, you know, you're right. You've called me on it. I'm sorry, I'm out. No. Ended up being the longest serving prime minister in British history and all my fault. The spotlight was intense. Specials keyboards and two-tone founder Jerry Dammers, the mastermind of the whole movement, began to doubt the whole thing. In New York, when a limo showed up to take the specials to their Saturday Night Live performance, Dammers refused, arriving at Rockefeller Center in the equipment van, not a limo. A sign of things to come. Within a few short years, most two-tone bands had broke up or moved on. But two-tone as an idea survived. The message, the music, and the style were here to stay. 
Two-tone is, in my estimation, a subculture, but it's like an umbrella for a whole load of subcultures. They all have their own individual styles of dress. But one thing I think you can say about all two-tone style is it is rooted in working class youth. Skinheads wear cut off Levi's. How many holes you have in your boots is absolutely paramount. What color your laces are, all of those kind of thing. And certainly the whole mod style um, was always you wore your best stuff because you want to look good at the weekend. You don't want to look like a hippie. I sort of deliberately drew the fists quite big because it sort of symbolised the, the aggression. We have here um, the actual artwork that I did all those years ago. Yeah, that's the, that's the original artwork that I drew. Um, that was to become the, the, the seven inch single bag and also the 12 inch. He was um, christened uh, Walt Jabsko. And check this out. Two-Tone founder Jerry Dammers modeled the actual Two-Tone guy after the image of Peter Tosh during Peter Tosh's Rude Boy era. Look closely, that's Peter Tosh. I was getting emails from Mexico and Singapore to say, um, you know, when are you going to show all this artwork? I thought, where is this artwork? You know, a lot of it was either lying under my bed or in my mum's shed. Got it all together and we had a great exhibition. Uh, I met up with a Chinese delegation that had come over, spoke to some mayor from some water city in China. He said, um, you have a SCAR event? And I said, yes, that's right. How do you know about that? He said, oh, SCAR is very big in China. And so, so I said, really? And, and that's, how, that's how it spreads throughout the world. It, this sleeve summed it all up. When the movie Dance Craze played our local cinema in the East Bay, Northern California. I remember seeing it with my crew. And we were so overwhelmed by the music that we started dancing right there in front of the screen. Who the hell does that? In 1987, Berkeley, California opened up a punk rock club run by the punks for the punks called Gilma Street. Man, it all started to happen quickly. Operation Ivy formed right after the club opened up, and we started to play our version of punk rock and ska. There are other American ska bands going on at the same time as Operation Ivy. Not a lot, but they're out there. Fishbone on the West Coast, Toasters and the Bostones on the East Coast. We didn't know it at the time, but we'd become known as members of the third wave of ska. Yo Gabba Gabba is punk rock. Like it's a punk rock show in the way that we did it ourselves, just like we did Aquabats records. Growing up in the 80s in Southern California, I never got a pure ska experience. The mutant bands that played ska here, it was more punk. So Operation Ivy was really on an island of, of their own. 86, 87, there was no one else doing that. It was kind of like a here today, gone tomorrow, and all those bands that came in to start the third wave of ska were directly affected by Operation Ivy. Bands like No Doubt and Sublime, Less Than Jake, Real Big Fish, Skink and Pickle, Hepcat. And then you have the Aquabats. <laughs> We used to say all the time that the Aquabats was the specials meets Devo, so. You had a lot of bands in Southern California, you know, heavy Latino, Vietnamese, and Chinese, like this big melting pot, whereas punk seemed like it was a white kid thing. And then rap became, you know, the, that black kids thing. Ska, it really said whoever, just come on in. When we first started the Aquabats, we didn't take ourselves super seriously in a scene that wasn't taking itself seriously. We pushed even further into the ridiculousness of it. This was an old Aquabats shirt right here, this pink one. The ska sound, for a second, everyone thought was gonna be the next big thing, and no doubt broke. And so all the record companies went out and started picking up all the bands that were playing ska, because Orange County ska was like, okay, this is it. And you even had bands that were totally punk and they just switched to ska. And they wore like suspenders and suits and stuff just to get signed. 
when it really came down to it, the mainstream is not gonna accept ska. It just, it, it was never gonna happen. Hello everybody! I think it's time for the Super Music Friend Show. I wanted to shift gears a little bit and I was watching TV with my daughter. Some of these shows that are like, what? Why does kids TV have to be so lame? And that's where Yo Gabba Gabba was born. <laughs> we won an Emmy for uh, best stunts in a kids show. And then that's next to the BAFTA here. So I started playing music for my kids and the stuff that they really liked was ska. Kids were bouncing around to it. Those upbeats means it's okay, have fun. And we've been able to put a lot of ska on Yo Gabba. We had the Agri lights on, we've had Hepcat on, the Aquabats of course, and you know, a couple of the characters on Gabba were Aquabats monsters that we'd fight on stage. This is where we keep the battle tram. This is the Aquabats battle vehicle. Dun dun dun! This is a monster we built for Aquabats. My son designed this monster. This is about as ska as it gets right here. Pick it up, pick it up. Boston became ground zero for racial intolerance. Everybody that created policy at that time seemed to have my skin color, but not my best interest in mind. Kids and young people don't really want to get caught up in the bullshit of their parents and sort of what was being handed down. Like, hey, fuck this, we feel good. When I went and saw the English beat, Ranking Roger fucking went for it, you know? And that's what I was looking for. Party with, with a political attitude, and from, from there I never looked back. When we were 18 years old, we went down to New York City to see Madness perform on Saturday Night Live. Suggs was a huge hero of mine, and, and you know, my first band, it was, you know, my hair was exactly like Suggs, cutting the flat top and the round glasses and the overcoats. You know, in an effort to label ourselves after years of saying we don't want to be labeled, we named a record Ska Core, The Devil and More. It's a ska band with a guitar player that rips and a singer that can't sing. I had toured so much and I really needed to rest. It, it coincided with Jimmy starting his TV show and I knew him because he was a, a long time radio guy. And he said, why don't you try um, announcing for the show? And I said, oh, that'll never work. Yeah, I'm the announcer. And I still do a certain amount of shows with the Mighty Mighty Boston's every year. And I credit and I thank every day, uh, you know, the music that I got into, the music that I fell in love with, and the records that changed my life and said, hey, you know, we're here for you. In the realm of pop music, the third wave did crash. But the classic mix of Jamaican dance music and punk, now known throughout the world as ska, spread throughout the empire of popular culture, evolving uniquely in each place and time. Vi är rassiga. Klockan är tag, vi ska lära extra snabba hem. För att vinna av design, då imorgon är det skolan, men är det lite lägre? The nerds. The freaks. And the weirdos. When we were... 15? 15. Yeah. We decided to start a band. Bergen in our what do you call it? Hood. In our hood. This is called Merlin Priest. I think when we discovered two tone, that culture represented like toughness that I think we really related to. Everyone is acting or being like really tough, but they're dressed really nice. But in Bergen, if you're in a punk band, you look so dirty and fucking disgusting. Everything about the culture is really appealing to us. The, the clothes, the music, the good vibes. Skinhead没有足够的自信 
，大家都一样的衣服。但我找任何地方，我我是这样的人。最早是。对，在九十年代末的时候，当时来自工人阶级、平民阶级，而且有一种团结的力量。然后，歌歌曲的音乐，音乐上面呢，又是那种很整的感觉。就是我想看的乐队，北京没有，那我只能玩一个自己想看的乐队。行了，我就不怎么摆盘了，是吧？收工，是吧？那就是真的是好多乐队是从这儿演出走起来的，包括我们，包括很多后来的乐队。这里面后天那个乐队的主唱呢，他是跟我年纪差不多，然后也一直是 s k i n h e a d 不受任何人干扰，就是 working class， 然后排练，就这是从应该 s k i n h e a d 的文化根源，从那些工人阶级，从。应该是六十年代六九年一九六九左右，大概兴起直到现在，所以就是也很绅士，也很工人，是这样的。呃，这才是一个真正的正能量和所谓的和谐。I remember someone had a specials record and we were play the shit out of it. That song Ghost Town. To me, was the epitome of like how I felt at that time period, you know. So, Sublime was like in that scene too, in a sense, because they were playing ska too, you know. They had a ska band before that, Sloppy Seconds. I grew up in Long Beach. Our whole gang was made up of punker kids, you know, black, white, Thai, Cambodian, you know, you name it. I was 18. My mind was open, and you know, I was just kind of trying to create some imagery that I thought would tell a story. So that was like the first image, like the beginning of the sun. And I think Brad walked in when I was like finishing it up, and he was like, "Oh, that's cool. What are you gonna do with that?" I think he threw me 20 bucks. <laughs> People still call me to this day from New York, Canada, Japan, all over. They're like, hey, I'm gonna be in Cali. I want to get a Sublime Sun. I didn't think that I'd still be tattooing it. I used to think these people don't deserve it, but I thought about it a lot, and I was like, it means more, you know, to them than I know. I have to give it, you know. It's weird. Like Brad's like this martyr, you know. Like he died for this drug addiction thing, you know, and a lot of people can relate with that. They were recording the self-titled album. I think that was like close to the last time I saw him. When I was done taking the picture, and I was like happy. That's the glorious moment of tattooing. You can't just give your all and not be affected by it. You know, he fucking spit his heart and soul onto that album, and that's what we have. He's not like just a guitar player, singer. You know, he had like a musical vision. How's that saying go? If we don't know our history, we are doomed to repeat it. The lessons of two tone are as relevant today as ever. Anytime we, the people, see something we don't like in the world, there's really only one thing to do: come together and make some noise. You bring in your own influences to it. I was influenced by Alp Ivy, Rancid, and the Specials, and a bunch of other bands. But then I brought in my element of like, well, maybe I'll sing this song in Spanish. Tonight we got a show at South Bay Customs in El Segundo. At a typical show, you have punks, skins, rude boys, rude girls, surfer types, and、uh, skaters, and it's it's all a big melting pot of every style, even some cholos too.、And、South Bay is about. 30 minutes south of Los Angeles, next to South Central, but by the beach area. It's a little rough. It's kind of sketchy, but that's where you grew up, you know. Our first shows were like opening up for DJs and backyard keg parties to cholos. 
The backyard scene is equivalent to the East Coast basement shows. You get some bands, the clubs won't book you. So you kind of just throw your own party and hopefully people show up to see your band. That's all you're trying to do. You're trying to get people to see your band in a backyard. That's how it starts for a lot of the bands. And that in itself has created its own community and scene where there's no rules. It'll be like a punk band, a straight like two tones band, ska core band, ska punk, a psychobilly band. So you get all that in one night. Hey, it's a fucking honor. Shout out to Buddha Gloss Coast. You guys are the fucking reason why we do this shit. Tonight we got a show with the, the Voodoo Glow Skulls, which are the first Latino ska punk or whatever. I mean, they were like 88. And I saw them climb, they were on the radio. And these dudes are from like the hood, they're from Riverside, like, that can happen. They're definitely the beginning of that era for a lot of us. It's a natural connection between the ska and like the Latin American side because there's just horns, it's danceable music. Latin people love the dance. And there's very working class and it's about the original kind of way. It's just their, their own take and flavor and it's all regionally from where they are. There's a huge scene in Mexico, big bands in their own right that just have a completely different take on two-tone. Maldita Vecindad. The shows are amazing. 8,000 plus people there just dancing. En el contexto de nuestra música mexicana, toda la música mexicana y toda la cultura mexicana es una cultura totalmente mestiza. Entonces para nosotros es el, el ska y el reggae fue solamente un elemento más a combinar. Y, pero un elemento que nos identificaba, ¿por qué? Porque los root boys, los vatos rudos del ska, eran exactamente como los pachucos, ¿no? Pachuquismo y tutón nos dan como resultado a la mera, mera maldita vecindad. <risa> El primer disco de los Specials y la primera rola de A Message to You, Rudy. Me acabo de escucharla y dije, wow, esto suena como a banda de pueblo de Oaxaca con ska, con la actitud punk. La misma esencia del barrio, de la fiesta del barrio. De, de esta realidad que aparte pues es la del barrio, ¿no? la misma identidad también que tenían el Root Boys en, en Jamaica o toda la banda también de la working class en, en, en Gran Bretaña, en Londres, en Inglaterra, ¿no? Agarramos este género y lo combinamos con todas nuestras referencias, ¿no? El mambo, la cumbia y de hecho el, el set afrolatino. Vamos a hablar de todo lo que nos duele, de todo lo tremendo y duro que es la situación de vivir en México siendo joven, pero lo vamos a hacer con alegría, ¿no? Lo vamos a hacer para bailar, ¿no? Lo vamos a hacer para hacer la catarsis de, de la alegría, ¿no? Con, una, con un elemento festivo. Muchas gracias, maldita vecindad en la casa. Gracias. Latin America, like the Caribbean, has its own colonial legacy and storied history of resistance and revolution. Long referred to as a third world, countries like Chile are no stranger to social upheaval, dictatorship, and outside influence of global superpowers. You see, these days, the empire has a different name, but the struggle is the same. This new generation was not born during dictatorship. They're not afraid, so they're very radical in their vision. Take a great artist like Anna Tishu, she's telling her own people's story in her own language. Because I think music is like, how you say this, is like the bi biography of your life. My parents have always been involved in politics. My mother used to be in a punk band when I was young. I think my mother used to be protesting when I was in the band, you say? I think that was already in my DNA at home. We had a dictatorship for 70 years. And in the 80s, Los Prisioneros arrived with another perspective with music. Nadie en el resto del planeta toma en serio a este inmenso pueblo lleno de tristeza. And when you listen to Prisionero, it's like, no, we are going to burn everything. But ironic, action, 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 action in the street, action now. And I think that was a bomb for the youth in the 80s. I love when I see an artist that is honest 
and not, not trying to be kind or nice. But I love the specials. For me, it was so so hip hop, like a mixture between England, Jamaica, pff, orgasm in my ear. I was like, ah. They're fucking amazing. I love that band. If you think about the special, if you think about Public Enemy, if you think about NWA, it's a response of a very specific moment of crisis, political, social, or economic, when the rage becomes songs, basically. And that's a magic moment. When I talk about colonization, it's not only about dictatorship from North America to Latin America. I'm talking about also uh, colonization in Africa. The fight can be very similar in so many ways with Chilean fight. When we talk about human rights and, and humanity, it's not only about Chile, it's a fight against dictatorship in the world. As artists, we got that mission, always to be very aware to not become a logotype of our own fighting. It's just about to see what happened in your neighborhood, in your community. It's nice to see how it moved from generation to generation, you know? Because I had no idea how popular the specials was until you go on Facebook and suddenly you're getting all these messages, like Argentina and places like that. I mean, it's incredible. To me, at the end of the day, I put it onto one thing. Good music, lyrical content that makes sense, that still means something today. Everybody in Chile, right? This one is a skanking one, you all gonna dance to this one. Here we go. <laughs> I consider that two-tone is an ongoing conversation with the population of the world because if they don't wake up to the fact that multiculturalism is the future and the only way you're going to get rid of racism is through miscegenation. Black people and white people doing what they should be doing with each other, which is making people who look like me. We grew up listening to music that was about helping you change your mind, not your fucking sneakers. You can't spend your life on the dance floor, man. Eventually your music's gonna stop and you're gonna have to go out and face reality. Once you say, okay, I don't wanna be on MTV, don't wanna be on a red carpet, then the world's a really exciting place again. And luckily I get to travel and see that there are a lot of people that still believe in music as a tool for social change. Music that can help you be all you can be. And Two Tone was part of that lineage, that heritage, that tradition. And long may it live.